nanohub.org. The last time we were uh, discussing some of the challenges uh, that emerge when trying to do dynamic atomic force microscopy in liquids. And uh, we uh, reached the point where we talked about the forest of peaks and uh, the origin of the forest of peaks, which I hope uh, you all understand now. Um, and uh, what attempts people have tried to make in order to uh, get rid of it. Okay, So uh, what we need to continue on is we're going to... Uh, go a little more in detail uh, about what happens in liquids when you take, uh, when the uh, oscillating cantilever actually interacts with the sample. We'll try to go over that part. So this is a little more technical, a little more detailed, yeah. but hopefully uh, you see some implications of it, okay? Uh, and then we'll try to end with um, a discussion uh, of, um, of new imaging modes and so on, okay, in AFM. So I'll try to do this very fast. I want to point out first, if you actually were to take the waveform, uh, uh, so you know there are ways in which in most AFM systems, although many of you may not have seen this, but there are ways by which you can uh, access the voltage signal coming out of the photodiode and display it in an oscilloscope. You can actually do that uh, in many AFM systems. Most of you have probably not done it, but it can be done. And so this is probably one of the first papers that tried to um, that tried to show um, um, you know how does a tip uh, oscillate in liquids um, what is the waveform and what you see interestingly is uh, what is plotted on the top left is the oscillation waveform as uh, one is approaching a sample and uh, the first thing you notice is uh, at point A, the amplitude starts changing, right, due to interactions. This is a very famous paper by Putman, one of the first ones that really did dynamic AFM in liquids. And uh, you observe the first thing that happens is the amplitude, let's say, starts changing at point A, and the amplitude starts decreasing. First thing they observed is the decrease is not symmetric. If you look at it, uh, the top part of the envelope doesn't change too much. The bottom starts changing. So the amplitude reduction is not symmetric. It's sort of accompanied by a shifting in the mean position of the cantilever as it starts interacting with the sample until it reaches point B when it is permanently, it's basically tapping and then at some point you bring it close enough, it touches the sample and it's in permanent contact. And you still get some vibration because even though it's in full contact, you're still shaking the base of the cantilever and the detector is picking up the bending of the cantilever, right? So even though you're, even though the tip is fixed now on the sample, the base is shaking up and down, right? Because you're shaking it uh, with PSI excitation. So the base is shaking, you're still getting some bending motion, some residual bending motion still remains, and the photodiode picks up the bending, rotation angle, so you pick it up, and uh, that's from B on to the right uh, is that motion. That's called residual motion. Uh, even in magnetic excitation, there's some residual motion, although in acoustic excitation, the residual motion is a lot more. So basically, the amplitude never goes to zero, even when you are in full contact. But uh, when uh, Putman uh, zoomed in on the waveforms, uh, he saw something very interesting, is these waveforms start off being symmetric, but as soon as, or rather, nice and sine waves, but as soon as they start interacting with the sample, you start seeing there are these... Um, uh, bumps that start appearing. You start seeing the waveforms distort at the points where the arrows are shown. You get local distortions that look like bumps that start building into the waveforms, right, uh, as that goes in. So the question uh, from early days was, what are those bumps? Because you don't see them when you do this in air. This is a very special phenomenon in liquids, just tapping on mica, let's say. So um, this is an important uh, observation. and. Uh, you know, when just a cup, there was a PhD student of mine who also tried to take up on Putman's work and tried to record these kind of waveforms. Uh, and he found something very interesting. Uh, he found these bumps also. So what, so instead of doing a continuous approach curve in this case, he acquired the waveform at different set points. So you can stick at a set point and get many cycles of oscillation then, right? And this isn't mica, this is a soft cantilever, typically free amplitude, 12 nanometers in water. And um, one of the first things he observed is 
the very top is when you're not touching the sample, not tapping the sample, then H corresponds to a 10% reduction in amplitude, right? Um, and, uh, you know, he saw that there are these bumps that start coming uh, at the very bottom. Um, they are very similar to the bumps that Putman observed, except that this was a magnetic excitation. So the bumps always happened at the bottom, and they had to do with uh, when you were actually tapping or impacting on the sample. So the bumps are very similar, uh, the, except that when he studied this very carefully, he found that these bumps are not isolated, that as you come closer to the sample, you see that the bump actually is the starting point of a little ripple that dies out. And uh, when uh, he did an analysis of uh, the time period of these little ripples, he found uh, it was actually the second eigen mode of the cantilever that was, uh, uh, each time you tab, the second eigen, second eigen mode, remember we've talked about the second eigen mode, it, it sort of was excited momentarily, like it twinkles and then it dies out. It's like ringing. So if you think of your cantilever as a uh, glass, each time you tap, you're ringing, you make it ring, right? So um, that's exactly what um, was um, uh, observed uh, in this uh, analysis, okay? Which was pretty interesting and um, uh, you can do it in different samples and the number of uh, uh, rings that you get uh, are uh, highly dependent on the sample. So uh, the harder the sample you tap on, uh, the more of this ringing uh, that you see. Uh, intuitively, it has to do with the fact that, um, you know, you're driving the first eigen mode of the cantilever and each time you tap, there's a pulse, interaction pulse, right? That pulse is going to act on the cantilever and uh, if the pulse is short enough, it's going to make the cantilever ring in the higher eigen modes also. It's like, you know, you just take anything and you tap it, all eigen modes ring a little bit, right? So in this case, the one that rings the most is the second eigen mode. The third, fourth eigen modes are very stiff. They don't really ring much, okay? So the main one that you observe is the th second eigen mode that rings a little. Uh, the key thing is that the amount of ringing sort of seems to depend on the um, stiffness of the sample. Not surprisingly, you try tapping um, a glass with a hard object, you get more ringing. You try to tap with a soft object, you get less ringing, right? So uh, that's the whole idea. So to understand a little better in simulation what really is happening, and this is what explains even Putman's results, is as you're tapping on the sample, what is happening is uh, the cantilever goes up, swings, and uh, uh, as it hits, you see there's a little uh, distortion that occurs because locally you're making the second eigen mode ring. A good way to look at it is to divide it up into what the first and second eigen mode is doing. And VEDA, you can acquire, you can do VEDA data and actually back out these kind of shape motions. Uh, but basically what is happening is the blue is the first eigen mode motion. Uh, as it oscillates, uh, it's going up and down. And uh, the, um, whoops, you see each time it happens, the second eigen mode rings. It's like a separate internal degree of freedom. So another way to think about this is that if you had a ball and you let the ball fall on a surface, right? You can hear the collision of the ball on the surface, right? Why do you hear it? You hear it because after hitting the object, the ball rings, right? And you hear it, right? So that's what we're talking about, that whenever there's a collision of two objects, uh, energy is transferred effectively to internal degrees of freedom. Uh, of uh, the two colliding objects. That's the basic idea. Uh, of course, each time you, when you're dealing with soft, low stiffness cantilevers, most of this ringing goes to the second eigen mode because you're driving the first eigen mode. This is the basic thing. If, if you understand why is it that when you take a basketball and just let it bounce, you hear it is because after impacting, the ball is vibrating. That's why you can hear it. And not surprisingly, as you, uh, uh, bounce a ball on a hard surface or on a carpeted surface, you hear different sounds. That means the amount of internal ringing uh, depends on the local material properties of the sample, okay? Another interesting thing that happens in liquids because of this ringing is, especially when you're on hard surfaces, this is not something that's critical uh, to, to uh, soft samples, but in hard samples, uh, you can have a situation where this ringing of second eigen mode causes 
like a dribbling drum roll like, you know, you touch the second eigen mode rings and, you know, instead of tapping once, you're tapping twice in each oscillation cycle. These kind of things also happen when you use soft cantilevers uh, on hard surfaces and liquids, okay? And uh, you can uh, identify these things very nicely. For example, if you um, plot phase lag, in this case, versus set point ratio as you approach a sample, it turns out that in liquids, the phase versus Z or phase versus set point ratio doesn't behave the same way as it does in air. If you do a comparison of phase versus distance in air and water, they, very, they look very different. You don't get transitions from attractive to repulsive and all those kind of things in water. It's different. On the other hand, as you go through, you actually get these relatively sharp transitions and you can sort of see them in uh, experiments also. This is experimental data where you got the uh, phase lag. Remember when you're at, uh, when you're not interacting with the sample, the phase lag needs to be 90 degrees. Remember that? And then as you interact with the sample, the phase lag starts decreasing in this case, which again means you're in the repulsive regime. So phase lag is all below 90 degrees, so you're in the repulsive regime, and even then you see these transitions that occur. And it turns out that these transitions have to do with uh, this transition from single tap to two tap kind of thing. So you, know, it's, you can sort of look for these kind of things. Uh, another important uh, uh, topic um, in liquids is the notion that as you do tapping mode imaging, uh, of topography, can you um, get some local material properties of the sample as well? And uh, one important property that's of a lot of interest is uh, that of local uh, stiffness because um, in reality, depending on the kind of sample you're dealing with, you can have a very wide variety of variations in modulus of the sample, right? So you can have parts, when you're dealing with lipids, for example, they can be extremely soft. You can be dealing with crystalline packed protein structures like in bacteria rhodopsin, where you can have up to 100 megapascal or even a gigapascal sometimes of elastic modulus. So you're really looking at, uh, you know, variation in elastic modulus, let's say from one kilopascal to one gigapascal. So six orders of magnitude difference typically do exist when you're dealing with biology. So this is an important property to map out, first of all, because you have a very wide variation of this property in biological samples. So if you can map this, you're, it's a good tool for doing assays. Uh, you, you always want to choose a, a property that has a lot of variation over the population you're imaging. If you have a, if you're trying to map a property that doesn't change much over a population, it's not very good for doing assays, right? So uh, mechanical properties, stiffness is a good one, elastic modulus is a good one to map in biology. Uh, not only because it has a very wide range, but also because these days people are becoming um, more aware of uh, the importance of mechanical uh, properties in biology itself. So there's interest in the topic itself, plus this property is uh, changes by a very large margin over uh, different kinds of samples. So, um, uh, so uh, a very important method to try and uh, sort of figure out um, uh, local mechanical properties is based on what are called FZ curves. Um, the group uh, out of uh, Manfred Radmacher's group uh, over in Germany uh, has done this for a very, very long time. Um, so what you do is you do FZ curves basically, right? Which you all know how to do. You have to convert FZ to FD and then fit your FD to a Hertz contact model uh, to try and, or uh, a Oliver Farr model or a Snedden model, different models to back out an elastic modulus. Uh, what you can do is also, if you're good about it, you can actually um, do it point by point. It's an extremely time-consuming thing to do what is called force volume things. Um, you know, so you might get, let's say, uh, this this might this this is probably uh, something that might have taken uh, an hour uh, to scan, uh, given that it's probably 20 uh, or it might be. Uh, maybe 25 pixels by 25 pixels image or something. Whereas most tapping mode images we take are uh, 256 by 256 uh, pixels. But at the same time, the advantage of this is you've done FZ curves at every point, so you have very clear uh, information, mechanical property information. Uh, uh, this is uh, an example of a nerve cell that Professor McNally uh, 
uh, at Purdue has uh, been focusing on for uh, for a number of years now. And um, one of the key things uh, I want to bring to your attention is that even um, in the analysis of force uh, distance curves, force F, for FZ curves, uh, you can see, for example, that different parts, when you do FZ curve on different parts um, of this neuron, that the response, FZ response, approach attraction is different depending on where you do it on. And so that's the whole point that, uh, you know, you can actually see very big differences, as is pointed out in this paper, uh, between mechanical response depending on where you're on the cell. So it's not a small thing. Even within a certain cell, you can get very different uh, changes in properties depending on the underlying cytoskeletal structure. So this is, again, a very good example to show how much variability that might exist within the same cell as well. So then, of course, given that there is variability from point to point on a cell or in a biological sample, it's natural to try and see if you can use tapping mode and to get high resolution maps of these properties because the properties do vary over the sample. And uh, the earliest attempt at this was actually goes back to Fenort uh, et al. Uh, in Langmuir, 1999, where um, they uh, studied something called higher harmonic imaging. And you're going to hear about that. And uh, I think Leila's talk is going to deal with that. But uh, effectively, you saw that when you, when you tap on a sample, you saw that the sine wave uh, of oscillation is no longer pure sine, but it's distorted. And a distortion in a sine wave means you're generating harmonics other than uh, the pure tone, single tone of a sine wave, right? And there are many harmonics. You can generate first, second harmonic, third harmonic, and so on. So um, for Nort et al., we're studying DNA uh, on mica, and they started uh, playing around with the uh, electrolytic concentration in the liquid. And uh, the uh, top left is the topography. Uh, and uh, the top, um, or the bottom, the C, the image bottom left, is the second harmonic image and the third harmonic image. So that was the first attempt at trying to get at uh, different channels. They started looking at these high harmonics and started seeing contrasts, uh, which then they attributed to changes in properties, except in that particular paper, they attributed it to changes in electrostatics. They said that this contrast fundamentally arises because DNA is primarily negatively charged. And uh, so they said that, look, you might get a different uh, interaction, and that's how, that's what's being mapped here. Of course, none of these things are very easy to say for sure. So uh, later, Peter Hinderdorfer uh, in Linz has uh, really been pushing second harmonic imaging. Now, I want to point out that um, the use of higher harmonics in AFM has been there for a very long time because, you know, you heard Ron talk about, uh, you know, uh, higher, you know, oscillation, nonlinear oscillators and uh, when, he, when he talked about frequency modulation. So from the early days, people knew that when you oscillate a particle in something that's not a parabolic, uh, you know, potential well, you're going to get higher harmonics. This has been known for a long time. Uh, what Hedredorfer, um struck upon was the fact that these higher harmonics are much stronger in liquids than they are in air or vacuum. In air or vacuum, if you try to track these higher harmonics, they're, they're almost in the noise. They're extremely small. In water, on biological samples, they are right there. You don't need to do anything. You will almost always get those signals uh, on many different kinds of samples. So um, he picked up on that, and he really uh, has been using it in many different uh, problems. Uh, so for example, this is the bacterial S layer, a high resolution image uh, up there, where on the left you see uh, topography. It's high resolution, so you can actually see uh, the periodic repeated pattern of the proteins that make up the bacterial S layer. And on the right, you see uh, the second harmonic image that shows very clear contrasts, right? Now, of course, interpreting these contrasts is difficult. Um, and in that particular paper, they said that they used very high buffer concentrations so that the Debye length was very small. Remember, I showed you last time that if you use high buffer concentrations, the force distance curve does not show any long-range interactions. You pretty much don't interact with the sample until you touch it. In which case, if that's the main interaction and there's no electrostatics, no matter about force, in that case, these contrasts must somehow have to do with interaction forces felt while contacting the surface. So it must be somehow connected to 
local elastic properties. And that's what they tried to prove through simulations. Uh, the, uh, a more recent paper, they tried to apply to living cells and fixed cells. And uh, so on the very top uh, row here, you find a topography image of a live cell, uh, amplitude. You all know the amplitude image is the error image. I hope nobody here actually is going to plot the error image as a photo and publish it. That image is supposed to be zero. If your controller is working properly, amplitude should be constant throughout. So you use that amplitude image n never to publish. You should never do it because it's an error image. There should be zero error. But you use it to fine tune your controller and you'd use it to uh, tell the audience how little error you have. So one of the things you do with these things is whenever you plot an amplitude error, I encourage you to actually plot the range. Say that, oh, over the sample, my amplitude error is just one nanometer. That's good practice. But I have known papers where people just publish the error map as the image because it looks good and there are problems. You can see why. You know, this is amplitude. What should it, was it, what is it supposed to be over a sample? Constant. It's tapping mode, right? The fact that it's not constant, it means your controller is not doing the job it's supposed to do. That's the problem. But of course, uh, the scale is not available here, right? I'm sure uh, this group is so good at these things. I'm sure the scaling, if you look at the scaling, even though you see the contrast in amplitude, it's actually very little variation in amplitude. I'm sure the controllers are all set properly, but it's just an observation I'm making to you that when you do your things, you should be careful about it. You get phase contrast. The second harmonic gives you some contrast as well. What they found interestingly is, it's when they looked at the fixed cell, which is the second row, uh, that the second harmonic really started showing some very nice features, right? But when it comes to the live cell, uh, if you look at the second harmonic image, you did see some contrast, but one can argue it's not any more or less than phase uh, contrast. It's really not much more, right? But they really found that for fixed cells, you could pick up a lot of things, a lot of interesting features with it. Um, you can do other tricks, you know, instead of looking at the second harmonic, you can try to remember this phenomenon I talked to you about that when you tap, you're making the second harmonic ring. And so there are two, three, so if you want to map local properties of samples, you can imagine the following experiment, right? So let's say you've got a basketball in your hand and you want to map the properties of the surface here, you know, the table, the carpet, etc. And, you know, being very simple, one way would be to, I'm going to leave the ball, let it hit and see how high it bounces back up. Right? I can look at total energy loss. Right? During impact, it's lost energy. I can simply go plonk, plonk it. I'm going to find that when I do it in the carpet, the basketball doesn't bounce back as much, which means more energy is lost during a collision. I do it on a hard surface, on concrete. I find it's going to bounce more. As a result, that is one intuitive way, and that's connected to energy dissipation, and that's connected to phase contrast also. Right? Another way is to say, I'm not going to measure how high it bounces back, but I'm going to listen to the sound. So I bounce it off a soft substrate, and I hear the sound. And remember, the sound comes from the fact that after collision, there's this internal degrees of freedom are ringing, right? So if I bounce it here, or if I bounce it, you get different sounds. So if you can sort of map the amount of this ringing of these internal degrees of freedom, that's another way to map uh, local properties. Uh, so that's what uh, you know one can try to do. This is a pretty specialized technique, uh, but the idea is you're trying to then capture this little ringing effects, or if you go back to Putman's paper, you know the distortions that he got at the bottom of the swing, you're trying to capture the magnitude of that as you go over a sample. It's of course not easy to do because in, in, in AFMs, you're using lock-in amplifiers. You don't use, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't have access to these nice signals usually you're using lock-in amplifiers. So the question is, if our task is to sort of figure out the extent of this distortion at the bottom, and it occurs once every oscillation cycle, how to do it? And, um, you know, so one way to do it is the following. It's just a conceptual idea. The blue is how the first eigen mode oscillates as you tap on the sample. The red is how the second eigen mode is moving, that each time you tap, 
it rings and dies out, rings and dies out. And so what we're trying to capture is a little ringing of the red curve. And the more it is, the stiffer the sample, the less it is, the softer the sample, right? Right? How do you get the sound is the question. We're not going to get the sound, right? Uh, it, it's just an analogy with the basketball because, you know, it, uh, in that case, the frequencies are low enough that you can actually observe. The key point is that there, each time the collision occurs, energy is transferred to internal degrees of freedom. That's the key thing. But it's not the energy at the end. What, which is the difference between the energy? So think about it this way. So good question. So Francisco's question is how do you connect it to energy? What's the connection? Very good question. If I take a ball, let it go, it hits the surface and comes back. It doesn't bounce back to the same height. So there's a loss in energy. Where did that energy go to? Right? It, if you think about it, goes into two sources, right? One is um, the, very, the forces between the ball and the surface are non-conservative, are dissipative. So during the interaction, there's some energy loss there, right? But the second source is the fact that during the collision, some energy was transferred to this internal ringing also. So we'll come to this in a second. It's actually a very fundamental topic because when most people study uh, collision of two objects, many people, most people don't take into account internal degrees of freedom, right? So the point is this. The point I'm trying to make is very fundamental that it turns out that let us say the interaction between this ball and the surface is perfectly conservative. No dissipation, right? So let's say there's some short-range interaction force, but there's no dissipation in the contact. So the, as far as force is concerned, its force is a function of distance alone, not a function of velocity. And let's ask the question, if I take this ball in this experiment, and let it, is it going to ball, bounce back to the same height or not? If you imagine the ball to be a rigid body, yes, it's going to go back to the same because the interaction forces are conservative. On the other hand, if you imagine it to be flexible, as it comes, it feels this impulse of a force, and it causes the internal degrees of freedom to ring. So it's a beautiful point that uh, you actually get energy, what looks like apparent energy dissipation, uh, loss in you know, energy as the ball bounces back, which has nothing to do with dissipative interaction forces, but simply has to do with the fact that the colliding objects have their own degrees of freedom. So uh, the key point here is that... Um, when you um, are trying to access this little ringing uh, that happens, one way to do it is to keep in mind that, uh, you know, the first eigenmode is oscillating in blue, and if you look at higher harmonics, you know, you get certain higher harmonics. The key thing is we're trying to capture the, the, the ringing in the red curve, and that happens, the ringing is at the second mode, and remember, the second mode is at like between six and seven times the frequency of the first mode. But nonetheless, the key point is, that if you think that the pulse that you see in the red curve happens once every oscillation cycle, so if you do a Fourier analysis, the fundamental frequency of the red curve is also going to be at the drive frequency because it happens once every drive cycle, so the drive frequency is the fundamental frequency if you do a Fourier transform of it. And if you do a Fourier transform, you actually find uh, the red curve shows higher harmonics of the drive frequency which reach a maximum value near the second bending frequency of the cantilever. So it suggests that if you're trying to capture uh, this little uh, ringing motion, um, what you're of course doing is you're measuring, what you measure is a combination of both, right? Because your laser spot is focused on the tip of the cantilever. What the suggestion is that if you want to capture that ringing effect, if you focus on these harmonics that are up here near the second eigen mode, you're effectively capturing uh, most of the signal that you're capturing is going to be due to the red, not due to blue, because the blue dies out and the red starts getting enhanced due to the resonance. So the idea is basically if you focus on these harmonics, then you're likely to capture the ringing. And if you capture the ringing, you've got a metric for measuring local property variation. So this is a simple example. You tap, this is purple membrane on mica, and uh, this is actually a real waveform the red one on mica, and uh, you see that uh, you get that, ri that ringing at the very bottom. You do a Fourier transform, and we see you know, the higher harmonics near the second mode are really amplified. These eighth, ninth, tenth harmonics are really amplified. You do it on the soft uh, uh, purple membrane, and uh, the ringing is really reduced. You see it in the red curve, 
but you can see it in the Fourier transform, these harmonics that are 8th, 7th, 8th, 9th uh, don't uh, light up as much. And so with that in mind, you can do simple imaging. Uh, this is purple membrane. Images taken of many different harmonics. Uh, the first graph on the top left is amplitude, is the amplitude signal. What should the amplitude signal be? It should be flat. And you see it's zero everywhere or constant <coughs> everywhere except at the edges of the object, of edges of a feature where the controller is trying to adjust itself. Uh, the key point, of course, is that if you look at these harmonics somewhere eighth to eleventh harmonics, uh, they start showing a lot more contrast. And not surprisingly, uh, brighter here means more ringing, greater harmonics of this eighth harmonic, ninth harmonic. And, uh, and uh, so, and the softer, the darker part means it's not ringing as much. So, softer means uh, darker in these higher harmonics. These specific higher harmonics means softer and, um, hard, you know, and brighter means more ringing, basically. And you know, you can play around with this and try different kinds of samples. Um, I show you here an example of DNA on uh, on mica, and you look at. In this particular case, it was done on the triangular lever where the second mode was actually not far from the fourth harmonic. So that's where we picked up this signal. Uh, you can look at um, purple membrane at high resolution where you see the trimer structure and you start seeing contrasts in these higher harmonics up there. So you can play around with this, with these kind of samples. Um, now we come back to the question that Francisco was asking uh, regarding difference between this ringing and energy dissipation. Um, remember, we derived a long time ago that sine of phase lag is connected to energy dissipation, correct? Uh, so that's the dissipation in virial that you derived. Uh, the big question, and that's correct, that's even correct in liquids, that relationship is always correct. Uh, the question always is, uh, what's the source of the energy dissipation? In air, people would always think that the source of the energy dissipation is uh, non-conservative or dissipative forces between the tip of the sample, that is viscosity, for example, right? Because you come close, move away, you've lost some energy because of some viscoelasticity of the sample, or it could be because of bond making and breaking. Um, and So the typical interpretation of phase lag would be connected to energy dissipation between the tip and the sample. On the other hand, I think you've seen already now that uh, in liquid especially, there's a lot of energy loss that goes into ringing or the internal degrees of freedom, right? In fact, you've already seen this simple example, hypothetical example, where the interaction forces could be completely conservative and yet you would see a energy loss because as the ball hits, goes away, you get a pulse, and it causes the internal degrees of freedom to ring. And so it doesn't fly back to the same height. Turns out in liquids, uh, uh, so how do you prove this is what's happening? So I guess what I'm going to point out is in, in liquids, uh, when you do the kind of samples I just showed you, DNA, um, uh, purple membrane, uh, viruses, these kind of samples, uh, it turns out that um, uh, the phase lag that you measure is actually mostly uh, due to energy going into ringing as opposed to viscoelasticity or tip sample dissipation processes. So a good proof of it would be, let's say you had a soft viscous patch on a hard mica <coughs> sample, right? Let's say you have that. Uh, if you're tapping in air uh, over such a hypothetical sample and you plotted phase lag as you went over it, uh, the phase lag, or rather the sign of phase lag, would increase when you went over the viscous part of the sample, right? Because there's no more tip sample dissipation. This is the standard understanding, right? So if you are in air and you had this, and you plotted uh, uh, phase lag or sign of phase lag uh, on this uh, substrate, you would see brighter i.e. the phase lag is greater on the more viscous part of the substrate, right? The more viscous, the greater the lag. The, great, the more the tip lags behind on a viscous substrate, right? So you would expect to see phase lag image, the viscous patch appearing bright. 
On the other hand, if the mechanism, now we put the whole thing in liquids, right? Now, what ends up happening in liquids, um, and uh, I'll provide you a couple of references that prove it, is when you're tapping, when you're intermittent tapping, like on bacteria and cells, or bacteria and viruses and membranes and so on, uh, when you have a soft viscous patch on a stiff substrate, now in liquids I just showed you, or I just tried to explain to you, the main source of energy loss is this ringing. Very little of it goes into viscosity or viscoelasticity of the sample. Uh, there are reasons for it, it has to do with low quality factors. But the point is that in liquids, because of this ringing, I already showed you you get much more ringing on a hard substrate, right? What we would expect then is the following. Because of this effect, uh, you would get more energy loss on a hard substrate, not because viscosity is greater, of course not, but rather because when you're in a hard substrate, you're making it ring. You're making the higher eigen modes ring, and there's a big energy loss that goes into, uh, you know, into the higher eigen mode. So, uh, when you plot sine of phase lag, you always plot dissipation, energy dissipation, or energy loss. Let's say the question always is in interpreting where does it go to? Does it go? Into, is it because of viscoelasticity, or is it this ringing that's happening? Right. In this case, in liquids, it's going to be ringing mostly, and so what we expect to see should be uh, that phase lag actually flip and a soft viscous material actually appear dark in a phase lag image or a sign of phase lag image compared to the stiff substrate. All right, so of course needless to say when we go back to most images taken uh, on purple membrane or DNA or viruses you, and if you make sure you're careful about plotting phase lag and not just some random phase but phase lag be sure Calibrate your system to figure out if your system plots phase lead or phase lag. We've discussed how to tell if your system plots phase lead or phase lag. And uh, sure enough, for example, uh, up on B, uh, you actually see topography image of purple membrane. The rough patches correspond to what's called the cytoplasmic phase of purple membrane. Smooth is the extracellular phase. And then you got a bit of mica, and in the phase lag image, sure enough, mica is the brightest which if you took your traditional understanding in air, would say phase lag is greatest, most energy dissipation in mica, and if you just used your understanding in air to, imp to interpret this, you would say, oh, there's more dissipation in mica, mica is more viscous than this biological sample or something like that, which of course is not true. It is true the energy loss is greater, but the reasons for energy loss are not due to uh, viscoelasticity, but rather you just get a lot more ringing transferring to internal degrees of freedom. That's where the loss is coming from, apparent loss is coming from. And, uh, you know, similar thing, this is a virus, and if you look at the uh, phase lag image, again, phase lag, the stiffest part is the brightest, which means most ringing happens in the stiff part, and the darkest part is uh, softest, because least ringing occurs on it. So, so, uh, in conclusion, um, we've uh, tried to highlight many differences uh, between air and liquid environment. It's definitely one of the growing areas, and there's many things that are not understood uh, yet. Um, and um, so I will uh, move on now to talking a little bit about some new developments in AFM, um, which are uh, the next set of slides that are given to you. Uh, yes? We do have a uh, cryo sample. Yeah? Cryo? Yeah, at the end of the last Oh, yeah, 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 that was, yeah, let me just, uh, it, you know, it was a comparison of, uh, there's a comparison of uh, the, uh, the image we get with an AFM with that taken from cryo EM, which you can get from databases online. Oh, it's not that you have a chamber in your AFM that no. has the cryo. No, 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 no. The, I mean, yeah, so all liquid AFM we're talking about is physiological conditions, ambient temperature. That figure is just shown to, because whenever you show uh, images of, uh, high-resolution images of viruses, uh, people like to see uh, 
whether that's real or reasonable. And for viruses, because you typically have, at least for bacteriophages, you have databases that tell you exactly, cry em based databases to tell you exactly what the shape is. The whole point of that thing on the left is to point out that um, uh, you cannot typically compare the structure of a virus taken from cryo-EM to the structure you get from AFM, mostly because of tip convolution. That's the whole idea. So if you don't do tip convolution, a cryo-EM reconstruction shows the following shape. But if you take that uh, shape and you convolve it with a five nanometer radius uh, thing, then that shape appears expanded up in an AFM. So the true comparison that has to be made is really between a co tip convoluted cry em data bank image and what you get in an AFM. That's the whole point of that. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, there is a lot of understanding for liquid base. I yeah. mean, air liquid. A, oh, a, air, I, I haven't actually talked about air-liquid interface yet. Yeah, but well, what I'm saying yeah. is, let's say the air, yeah. uh, I'm just, yeah. you don't have to answer to me right now, yeah, yeah. The, the air has certain humidity. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible to adapt some humidity control in, in the air? So then you can make it quite dry or... Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the, a lot of AFMs have humidity control chambers. Um, in the cases, everything we're doing in biology uh, has dealt with having a, uh, a chamber in which the sample is completely immersed in water and the cantilever also is immersed in water. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of applications where you don't want everything immersed in water. At the same time, you do want to study the effect of humidity. What humidity typically does is it, it, it grows a native layer of water on your sample, and the extent of it depends on the humidity control. And so what one expects to see if you do humidity control, in, as far as phase contrast is concerned, is remember, when the tip interacts with the sample, there in air, there's always this layer, layer of water that it's trying to, there's a menis, meniscus that forms and breaks. So it turns out that there is evidence that uh, as you increase humidity, the losses that you get due to meniscus making and breaking start dominating uh, what you see in cantilever dynamics and phase contrast. And so there's some good papers that have tried to prove that you can therefore, by controlling humidity and having samples that have regions of hydrophilicity or phobicity, you can tell from phase contrast uh, which is which. Because on a hydrophilic, you have a lot of liquid layer and therefore lossy, lossier as far as, because the mechanism of loss is there is mostly this making and breaking of meniscus.